Hi everyone, welcome to Sacred Musings. It's podcast number 21 and it is the 3rd of February 2022. Oh. No, I should say 3rd of February 22. I said no more 20s. Someone agreed with me on Telegram, so it's sorted. That's no more 20s. It's just uh, 22 now. So uh, there we go. Um, my name is Phil Saker. Um, we're today looking at freedom on the podcast. So this is the uh, fourth part of the More Than Survival series, where we're looking at uh, how life should be just more than about surviving, but but what life, true life, should really be about. So freedom is what we're going to be thinking about today. Before we come on to that, uh, as always, uh, just one or two um, little notices or you know things which I'd like to share with you. Um, uh, there's lots of good stuff that's come out this week, um, so I'm not. I'm sure that you're all aware of. You know, you look at the Daily Skeptic or whatever. Um, I really enjoyed looking at the lessons from the pandemic article. If you haven't read that, it's by Dr. Simon M. Fox, and um, it's the uh, uh, one of the longer articles called Lessons from the Pandemic. And um, I think it's that's worth reading. Actually, that was that was really good. Um, I, I really like the quote that he includes by um, Warren Buffett, who said. It's only when the tide goes out that you discover who's been swimming naked. And uh, he makes the point that over the last couple of years, it's like the tide has been out and we have well and truly discovered that as a society, we were swimming naked, if you like. And um, I think that's a that's an interesting article. And that's why I'm doing this podcast. That's why I'm doing this More Than Survival series. It's actually to say, well, where as a society... And as a church, have we not been measuring up to what life should be like? Um, what what have the problems been? And so that's what I've been I've been trying to do. Um, also, just this morning, um, there was a review on Ian Paul's blog on Sefitzo. Uh, um, Ian Paul's blog, um, Does God Still Perform Miracles Today? Which is a review of Craig Keener's recent book, Miracles Today, the supernatural work of God in the modern world. Um, but what I, um, <clears throat> but what I, I was found helpful about this was not so much, you know, thinking about the the review, the book itself, but just what he says about how it, it in sort of inspired his his faith, if you like, um, which says that. Um, let me just quote a little bit from the review. I found in reading the book over the space of a few weeks that it was beginning to have an effect on me, chipping away at my, well, let's be blunt, unbelief. I found my faith strengthened and renewed, not simply at the thought that I might see God work a miracle sometime soon, though I'm not now discounting that, but more that if God really is at work all around the world, breaking in and doing things we call miraculous, then that means something for my prayer life. And it means something for my expectations beyond this life. <clears throat> now, I thought that that was really, um, really good, actually. And, and I thought that's just, uh, you know, inspiring, isn't it? That I think part of the problem that, that we as a as a society and particularly as a church have been, you know, why is it that the church have responded in the way that they have to lockdown and, you know, treating safety as if it's the most important thing in the church? I think part of the reason has been that we've just almost forgotten that God works in the world. We've almost forgotten that God answers prayer, that God does uh, keep promises and so on. And that we have to deal with things in an entirely kind of secular way. <clears throat> um, and, you know, this is this is why I think that we've forgotten that God does more than that. Um, you know, we can expect him. We can trust trust in him in faith. Let me just give you, before we, we look at the main thing, let me just give you one brief example of that from my own life. You know, last week I mentioned our house situation. Um, and um, if you didn't catch that, basically I was saying we might have to move out. Well, it's it has been confirmed now. Uh, our house, basically we are tenants. Um, and um, the, it's the house that we live in is owned by you know, the Diocese, the Church of England. And they are selling the house because it's now surplus to requirements. It's a long story. I won't go into all of the ins and outs of it. But um, yeah, we found out last Friday that we needed to move house, um, that we would need to move out. And, you know, we were hoping that we might actually be able to stay here. We might be able to buy this house, but it, it turned out not to be possible. So, you know, went round on Saturday uh, afternoon looking at, you know, registering with the estate agents and so on. 
And one estate agent just happened to say, um, oh, we've got this house, which has only just come onto the market. You know, can um, would you like to have a look? So he went round and looked at it Saturday afternoon. And it was the first house that we'd seen, which was even suitable. You know, that we'd seen a few houses a few months ago. But um, we'd been keeping an eye. But really, there was very little that was actually suitable for us um, in terms of, you know, um, well, anyway, um, I won't go into all of that as well. But yeah, we looked and um, and so we thought, well, you know, this this was like God's provision, you know, just of the fact that we were the first ones to see it. It was like the day after we found out that we'd have to move out. And um, so we, we made an offer on the house and, and they accepted um, the offer. Um, and so um, earlier this week and, you know, I just I just think this is God's working. You know, this is trusting in God. This is saying, although, you know, bad things in the world do happen that we trust God to guide us and lead us through and if we commit ourselves to him and to doing what is right then he will hold us and help us and lead us so thank you everyone I know that a few people made comments about about the house um, last week because I mentioned it and I just wanted to say that you know we can trust the Lord and that he will um, hold us and guide us and lead us and that's something which is really important to for us to remember at the moment and you know we need to hold on to that as a church that we can trust in the Lord that he does he does lead us and he does hold us and he guides us and he's there in our lives okay so let's move on now to think about freedom let's uh, look at the main section so let's look into freedom now just 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 wanted to start by saying why it is that I think it's important to look at freedom and I think it's important because over the last couple of years, people have been very willing to give up freedom because they think um, of security. You know, that um, we want to give up our freedoms because we want to be safe from COVID. Um, you know, so for example, um, isn't it better to lock everyone in the house because people are dying of COVID? So fewer people might die if, if we give up our freedom. Or vaccines, you know, let's give up our bodily autonomy because... Um, you know, and, and enforce people to get the vaccine because then that would be better because, you know, we'd defeat COVID and that kind of thinking. And I think we need to defend freedom. You know, we need to make the case for it. We can't just assume that people are on the same page when it comes to freedom. And so what we're going to do today is um, just have a think about what it is that why freedom is important, what the Bible says about freedom and uh, how we get there because this is something which is really fundamental actually to what what the bible says about human beings so the first thing is that freedom is a moral question that freedom is what gives us dignity as human beings it's actually what distinguishes us from the animals so this is what it says in psalm 32 verse 9 which strangely enough i, I read psalm 32 this morning um, do not be like the horse or the mule which have no understanding but must be controlled by bit and bridle or they will not come to you so the animals have to be controlled you know they don't have freedom to to do what what they want but they have to be controlled but we as human beings we've been given a choice we've been given kind of moral responsibility so we need to uh, to, to choose to do what is right and that is actually where our uh, one of the things the major things which gives us our sense of dignity as human beings as humans made in the image of God is having freedom to make moral choices so freedom is a is a moral question it's a question of human dignity so what things in the world cause us not to be free Let's think about some of the things that cause us to lose our freedom or cause us to, to restrict freedom. One of the things is, is human limitation. Um, so, for example, I'd love to be free to fly, but I can't fly because I'm not a bird. I haven't got wings, so I can't fly. Um, I can't be in two places at once because I'm a human being. I'm limited and so on. Um, there are natural dangers, you know. You, well, I personally wouldn't do this, but some people might like to be free to climb into a live volcano. But then you've got the danger of the lava, the heat, all of that. It might erupt, all of that kind of thing. So there are natural dangers in the world. You know, you can't just go where you want to um, or certainly you, 
you know, you face the risk of what might happen if you do. There are accidents, you know, so we have, um, uh, for example, um, if you go to a hotel, you open the um, the window, you might not be able to open the window wide because they want to prevent people falling out of the window, which is understandable. So accidents happen as well, and that restricts our freedom. And there's also, and I think this is the major one, it's bad behaviour. You know, so I can't be free to just leave the front door open the whole time or unlocked the whole time because someone might come and break in and steal things. That kind of thing goes on. So we have locks on the door and, and so on. That restricts our freedom as well. Um, so we're not free for all of those reasons. You might be able to think of more reasons. But what does the Bible say about the deeper reason why we're not free? This is what Jesus says. This is uh, John chapter 8, um, verse 34. Uh, Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Everyone who sins is a slave to sin. So this is what Jesus says that um, is... Um, is, is restricts our freedom. It's it's sin. It's when we we do what is wrong, when we don't do what is loving to God or to our neighbour. And the problem is that those things are not just uh, you know wrong actions, but there's a power to them. It's like an addiction. In our church, we um, help down with the the soup run in our local town, and there are people there who have drug problems. And I remember talking to one of our um, church folk a couple of years ago who was saying there's a guy there, you know, a drug user who comes and he said it's such a shame because he could make something of his life. You know, he's an intelligent guy, a nice chap, but he doesn't want help. That's the problem that the, the drugs, the addiction has got him, that he just doesn't want help. And this is the problem with sin as well. It's, it's like we're addicted to our wrong ways, that we don't want help. That's the problem, that sin is more than just doing wrong things, but it's like an addiction to doing the wrong things. You know, we want the wrong things. We don't want help. That's why we are not free, according to, to Jesus. And we're also not free, as, as it says, I think we looked at this a couple of weeks ago, um, because of, of death. This is what it says um, in Hebrews 2.15. And free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. So we are not free because we're worried about dying and, you know, we want to prolong life as long as possible. So we we fear what might happen in death. And, and so we don't live freely because we're worried about death. So those things then, you know, sin, our own desires, um, fear of death, that's what what holds us in slavery. And um, of course, we talk, um, I think we talk a bit about uh, Satan as well, that the evil is more than just, you know, um, evil is more than just, uh, you know, a, an absence of good. But there is a force, there is a, Satan, you know, that the evil is a force in the world as well. The, typically, the three things which Christians have considered, the world, the flesh and the devil, um, or, you know, the, the world, the temptations in the world, temptation from within ourselves and satan um, are the things which restrict our freedom if you like cause us to do what is wrong rather than what is right cause us to live in ways which which limit our freedom now how do we respond to this then one way that that we respond is by setting laws that we say well you can't do this you can't do that we restrict our freedom in order to in order to, um, you know, to, to prevent us from doing bad things. But actually, that doesn't really work. Now, you might be surprised at that because you think, well, didn't God give us the law? Didn't God give us the Ten Commandments um, and, you know, tell us what's right and wrong? And uh, yes, he did. But why did God give us the law? Well, let's look into that. This is what it says in Galatians chapter 3, verses 23 and 25. Before the coming of this faith, we were held in custody under the law, locked up until the faith that was to come would be revealed. So the law was our guardian until Christ came 
that we might be justified by faith. Now that this faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. So what Paul, the Apostle Paul here says, is that the law was like a guardian. And this is the word that he uses is like um, a guardian that you might give to to children. Because you know that with a child, you can't just let children do what they want to do, but they need a bit more guidance. They need to be kept controlled a bit more. Um, And this is this is what the law was to us. That's why God gave us the law, because we needed that we needed that until Christ came. But now that Christ has come, we're not uh, we don't need the guardian anymore. And um, so that's the thing that the you know the law was not a permanent uh, thing, but actually was something which um, was only until Christ came. That in Christ we have freedom. So let me read you. Uh, Again, some verses from um, from the Bible talking about freedom in Christ. This is Isaiah chapter 61, verse one, which is actually a prophecy. But Jesus reads this verse and applies it to himself um, uh, in the uh, in uh, the gospel. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners. So Jesus says that he has come to proclaim freedom for the captives. What was it that was holding us captive? It was sin. It was all of the things that we've been uh, we've been talking about. That's what Jesus said he's come to proclaim freedom from. And so if you go to the New Testament, this is uh, Galatians chapter 5 verse 1. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. And then again, 2 Corinthians 3.17. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So Christ came to set us free. If the law could have set us free, then that would have been fine in the Old Testament. You know, the Old Testament people would have have been free, but, but they weren't free. You know, we still needed Jesus to come and actually set us free. And that's the the whole point of this, that, yes, we don't have freedom apart from Christ, apart from the Holy Spirit. He is the one who sets us free uh, to actually live in the way that we are supposed to live, to live in in God's ways of love. That is true freedom. You know, the problem is that the law is not the solution to to all of the things which um, prevent us from having freedom. The law is not the solution. I've just got a couple more Bible verses before we look at a summary of all of this. So this is Romans chapter 3 verse 20. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. So the law makes us conscious of our sin. That's what it was there for. But it doesn't give freedom. That was the thing with the the Old Testament law. So how should we live instead? This is Galatians chapter uh, 5 verse 18. So I say live by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. If you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. So that um, Paul says there's two ways to live. There's living under the law or living by the spirit. And that as Christians now, we are under the by the spirit. We live by the spirit and not under the law. That we're not going to be made righteous. We're not going to be set free by being under the law. We need the Holy Spirit for that. Now, I appreciate that this is all quite complicated um, and I'm going through this quite quickly so I I, I do apologise if this is a bit too fast for you. Um, I did a series on Galatians um, on Understand the Bible um, sermons that I preached at church and if you'd like more then I can really recommend getting stuck into the book of Galatians because it really goes through all of this kind of stuff and um, it talks about freedom and how it, why it's important and why we can't have freedom through just simply um, obeying the law. 
But let's look at a summary as just, just to where we've got to at the moment. So we've seen that freedom is essential to our dignity as God's image bearers. We've seen that freedom means the freedom to make wrong choices, even if that means then that we need to be punished. It means that freedom, true freedom, is freedom from sin and death, which comes only through Christ and the Holy Spirit. So um, true freedom is the freedom to live in God's ways without doing what's wrong. It's actually sin, which is what robs us of our freedom. And the law cannot bring freedom. Human rules cannot bring freedom. Only the Holy Spirit can do that, can, can bring us true freedom. So this is what the, the Bible teaches about, about freedom, that we were created free. We were created to be free, but what robs us of our freedom is sin. And actually, when we come to Christ, when we have the Holy Spirit, he can restore to us that freedom, the freedom to live rightly in the world and, um, and to do what is right without kind of the, the restrictions of the law, because the law cannot bring freedom. So what does that mean then when it comes to to the last couple of years, to the situation in the last couple of years? Is freedom something which the government can take away? That's a really uh, interesting and important question. I'm really struck by the way that God treated Adam in the garden when he said, this is from Genesis 2 verses 16 and 17, The Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. God gave Adam freedom. He gave him the command. He said this, you know, don't eat from the tree. This is what will happen if you do. So he gave him the facts. He told him, but he he, he felt freedom was such an important thing that Adam had the freedom to make that choice, to be responsible so, you know, that's how God treated Adam, you know, gave him the dignity as a human being of that, that kind of moral responsibility. What, what should governments be there for then? I think it's, it's that similar thing. You know, governments might need to punish, but um, should preserve human freedom. So this is what it says in Romans 13 verse 4. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. So uh, governments might need to punish. And that's why I think the a big reason why God has given for governments to exist, uh, to, to punish those who do wrong. You know, because you can't, ha- you couldn't have a society without that, could you? You need prisons, you need a judicial uh, system, you need to punish people who do the wrong thing. But that doesn't mean restricting freedom. And that's something which, um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot more that you could say about that. But I think, you know, the way that God governs, you know, giving us that freedom, that moral responsibility um, is really, uh, is really significant. And it's the freedom to do what is right. You know, it should, we should always have the freedom to do what is right uh, according to our own conscience. That's something which is, is really significant. What about um, the freedom then when it comes to mitigating risk? Uh, And particularly, of course, over the last couple of years, we've been thinking about um, the risk of spreading COVID. Uh, And I've got um, those of you who are listening on the podcast, I've got um, a a line here with an arrow at both ends. You know, on one side, we've got freedom. On the other side, we've got mitigating risk. Um, Of course, you know, there's a line, isn't there, that, you know, we have to kind of draw a line somewhere that I, for example, wouldn't go skydiving or I'm not really, I'm quite risk averse in some, in some respects. So, you know, but the, but the question is though, whose job is it to draw, to draw that line? You know, is it, is it the government's job to draw that line and say, well, it's too risky to spread COVID, so don't even see your closest family? You know, that I think actually 
mitigating risk is not necessarily the right thing to do. That we should have freedom to do what is right and what is good according to our own conscience um, and that the government should not dictate what that right thing is. And that's the point here that, you know, the freedom there is the freedom to do do the right thing. I was really struck um, by this quote from, um, I've been reading a book called Gentle and Lowly by Dane Ortland. I just started that uh, the other day. Um, there we go. So you've got the book here. And um, uh, yeah, I was really struck by a quote that I read yesterday about, about Jesus. This is what he says. Jesus Christ's earthly ministry was one of giving back to undeserving sinners their humanity. We tend to think of the miracles of the Gospels as interruptions in the natural order. Yet German theologian Jürgen Moltmann points out that miracles are not an interruption of the natural order, but the restoration of the natural order. We are so used to a fallen world that sickness, disease, pain and death seem natural. In fact, they are the interruption. Jesus walked the earth rehumanising the dehumanised, and cleansing the unclean. Why? Because his heart refused to let him sleep in. So wherever he went, whenever he was confronted with pain and longing, he spread the good contagion of his cleansing mercy. Now that quote really leapt out at me. Jesus went about rehumanising the dehumanised. And I just thought, yeah, that's, that's what's right, isn't it? You know, the freedom to go about dehumanizing, uh, rehumanizing the dehumanized, to go about showing people this is what humanity is. This is what life is. This is living life, not being afraid. This is living life, loving one another, um, doing the, the right thing for God, for our neighbor, um, rather than just simply saying, yes, it's about stopping people from getting covid and that may be the right thing to do uh, on occasion. You know, if you are you know that you're ill, um, then the loving thing to do might be to stay in bed and not to, to spread it, of course. But to say to everyone, you know, stay in, don't, don't go out, you know, just don't even see your, your friends and family. So dehumanising. But actually Jesus rehumanised uh, the dehumanised. You know, he cleansed the unclean. And I think that's the model for us about how we should think about, you know, um, mitigating risk, how we ought to think about, um, you know, freedom, that it's the freedom to be like Jesus. It's the freedom to go and be among people who are broken and hurting, you know, people who are lonely, people who are isolated, to go and be among them, to be with them and to, to minister to them as Jesus did. I think that is true freedom, um, knowing that, you know, pandemics and everything they're an interruption in the um in the the natural order actually they are wrong you know and they're because of sin and and we need to go and um be free to to actually go to people and to to minister to them in the way that jesus did um it really struck me that quote actually that it's from gentle and lowly by a dane ortland um so let's go back then to that that Um, spectrum there on the one hand mitigating risk and on the other hand freedom and I just wanted to finish by asking the question or two questions really which is can we live in the freedom part of that spectrum because obviously people will some people will draw a different line in terms of freedom and risk and so on that's understandable you know some people will have a greater tolerance to risk no problem but the point is do we have the freedom to live according to our conscience according to what we believe needs to be done do we have freedom to love others in the way that God wants us to I think that's a really important question and another important related question is were we doing that prior to 2020 and it goes back to what I mentioned about um, the Warren Buffett quote uh, at the start you know when the the tide goes out, you can see who is for me naked. And I think this is what's happened. You know, I think I've realised that prior to 2020, I'm not sure that we as a society and we as a church were living in freedom. And I think this is this is the thing that, you know, freedom is, um, 
freedom is something which is not an optional extra. But we as the church particularly should be living in it and showing the world what it means to live in that kind of freedom. And um, I'm not sure that we were. So this is why I want to do this series. Um, And I'll, I'll, I'll leave the last quote actually kind of leads me on to the last quote. This is from Ronald Reagan. And um, this is what he says. Freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. We didn't pass it to our children in the bloodstream. It must be fought for, protected and handed on for them to do the same. Or one day we will spend our sunset years telling our children and our children's children what it was once like in the United States where men were free. I think that's a great quote. You know, we don't pass freedom on in the bloodstream. It's something that has to be taught. And I think particularly in the context of the church, you know, we have to to discover that freedom again. Otherwise, we'll, we'll go back to the law. Otherwise, we'll go back to the ways that we, you know, in the Old Testament, you know, and, and um, I think that's just what, what has happened. I think that was what, what was happening before 2020. And I think we, particularly as the church, but also as a society, need to be proclaiming that message of freedom and living it, showing people this is what it means to live as free people. This is what it means to live with the freedom to do what God calls us to do in our conscience. You know, the, the freedom to live by the Holy Spirit and to, to walk in God's ways. This is what it means to have freedom. This is how good it is. This is how important it is. And this is why we don't we can't give it up even in the middle of a pandemic. So freedom is something that, yeah, it's, it's never more than a generation away from extinction. We need to constantly go back to that message and we need to be proclaiming it. That's why freedom is important. Well, folks, I hope that that made sense. Um, I think the freedom in the Bible is a very big topic and I appreciate that that was a very brief um, sort of in introduction and I'm not really sure actually thinking about it that it actually really made very much sense so I do hope that it, it perhaps made a bit more sense than I think it did um, but it, it you know I'd like to do more on this actually about looking into freedom but like I, I, I think I mentioned I did a series on Galatians um, in um, or I meant to mention anyway on understand the Bible um, and um, there's a series of sermons on through the book of Galatians. And I think that book, Galatians, more than any other, explains what Christian freedom is. How we don't find freedom in following the rules, following the law, but we find freedom in Christ through the Holy Spirit. That's something which is really important. So if you want to look at those sermons, I'll try and put a link up in the description below. Um, through to the, the whole playlist on Galatians and you can look at that and um, I think that will help fill out understanding a bit more than I managed to in one kind of short session. Um, so just before we finish then I want to just finish with a, a reflection on the Bible and um, this is something which I, I actually read in my own. I've been reading through the book of Ezekiel recently and I came across this passage yesterday and it really struck me one of the things which I've noticed over the last couple of weeks is that um, I've got a bit annoyed because it does seem more and more like people are beginning to uh, see the problems with lockdown and come out against it and the restrictions and so on. Um, Douglas Carswell, I think he said some months ago on Twitter, actually, um, that he... Uh, yeah, he said in a few months, in a, in a few months or years, everyone will have been against the lockdowns. And it's, you know, it's like the in the war, you know, the, um, when France was liberated, all of a sudden everyone was a member of the resistance. And I think it will soon be the case that everyone will have been against the lockdowns. And I think for me, you know, who's taken a stand against it at, you know, well, it, it, it's not been easy and, you know, I've certainly had resistance um, in, in various different quarters. And, um, you know, it's taken its, um, I say it's taken a toll. I mean, it, you know, don't feel sorry for me, folks, because, you know, it's nothing like what a lot of people face. Um, but, you, you know, you know the, the toll of people 
thinking that you're a bit crazy or thinking that you're dangerous because you question these things or and so on and 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 yet now you know having been through all of that people are starting to say the same kind of things that I and many others have been trying to say for two years or nearly two years and questioning it and it's getting a bit annoying isn't it (laughs) you know that you think uh, hold on a second you know you were persecuting people a year ago who were questioning the lockdowns and now you're coming out and saying the kind of things that we used to say um and i think this biblical this part of the bible here really spoke to me because i think it means it it, it means that we need always to leave that door open let me uh, let me read you what it says so this is ezekiel chapter 33 from verse 10 son of man Say to the Israelites, this is what you are saying. Our offences and sins weigh us down and we are wasting away because of them. How then can we live? Say to them, as surely as I live, declares the Sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn from their ways and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways. Why will you die, people of Israel? Therefore, son of man, say to your people, if someone who is righteous disobeys, that person's former righteousness will count for nothing. And if someone who is wicked repents, that person's former wickedness will not bring condemnation. The righteous person who sins will not be allowed to live, even though, um, uh, even though they were formerly righteous. If I tell a righteous person that they will surely live, but then they trust in their righteousness and do evil, none of the righteous things that person has done will be remembered. They will die for the evil they have done. And if I say to a wicked person, you will surely die, but they then turn away from their sin and do what is just and right. If they give back what they took in pledge for a loan, return what they have stolen, follow the decrees that give life and do no evil, that person will surely live. They will not die. None of the sins that person has committed will be remembered against them. They have done what is just and right. They will surely live. Now this passage really spoke to me in that in that situation because it's the whole notion of repentance which is key to to the Bible. That's key to Jesus's message, you know, repent and believe. That's the heart of Jesus's message. And the the door must always be open for repentance. That although you know for those of us who've um, stood against the lockdowns at some uh, personal cost um and for those particularly, you know, it, it may be galling for people who persecuted or it felt like that anyway um, at the time and, and were saying, oh, no, you're just granny killers. You know, you're being dangerous, all that sort of thing. Um, you're conspiracy theorists, whatever that may be, and uh, who are now saying the same kind of things. I think we need to remember that there is always a door open. God always leaves a door open to us and that you know, God doesn't treat us like that. You know, he doesn't say, well, you know, you once did a wrong thing. You once had the wrong thought. So I'm not going to leave the door open to you. But he says, no, I don't want anyone. I don't take pleasure in the death of the wicked, but I want everyone to turn and live. So I think it's the, the important thing is to remember that we must always hold the door open uh, to people to come to come to what I believe is the right way of, of thinking you know, that we must always leave the door open and say, yes, although we may have disagreed in the past and although you may have poured scorn on me for holding different opinions, that I'm not going to hold that against you because God does not hold against us the things that we did in our ignorance. And yeah, I I really felt that actually as I was reading it um, uh, yesterday, that, you know, we must always hold the door open for people to come round and you know we mustn't be bitter about it when you know people who once poured scorn on us are now saying the same things that we did that's not um you know that's not what god does that's not what we should do we should we must always allow room for repentance um and um yeah i hope that people will will see will repent of the way that they treated people who tried to to sound the alarm before um, but that's that's between them and God, you know, and that 
um, it's not our place to hold a grudge and to be bitter about it. That's the wrong thing to do. You know? So, yeah, that was just my reflection, you know, about just leaving the door open always for people to change their minds and come round. Um, that's what God does to us. And that's what that's the 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 privilege, um, not the privilege, but, uh, you know, that's what we, we must allow the space for other people to do that. Now let's take a moment to pray as we close and um, ask God for his help in both proclaiming that message of freedom, living that message of freedom and in, you know, giving people um, not not holding a grudge or being bitter when people come round, <laughs> um, which is, yeah, is a challenge, I think. So let's pray. So, Heavenly Father, we thank you that you made us uh, free and that you have made us um, in Christ to have that freedom uh, by the power of the Holy Spirit. We pray that you would help us to really know what that means, to live freely, uh, to live in your ways, to live uh, in your ways of love. And we pray that you would help us to to be able to proclaim and teach that message uh, to the next generation, um, that we may be free as your people. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that you would help us to um, not be uh, bitter or hold grudges uh, towards anyone who changes their minds, um, but always to hold that door open. And uh, we pray, Lord, that you would help us to treat others as you have treated us, not remembering the sins of the past, but always um, giving space uh, for repentance. So we thank you, Lord, and we pray that you would help us to be more like you, more like Jesus. And we pray this in his name. Amen. Well, thanks so much uh, for um, bearing with me today. Um, I'm not sure I've made very much sense today, actually. Um, so um, this is a difficult topic, and I think this has not been um, a very um, a very good look at it. Um, I think it's a uh, anyway. So I'm sorry about that, but I do yeah do look at the Galatians sermons if you want more about kind of Christian freedom. And uh, yeah, if you appreciate what I do in general, then there's a buy me a coffee link down below. Also, you can like subscribe um, as I do um, appreciate that. It makes um, it helps me out with YouTube and uh, there's um, uh, you can get an email when I uh, upload some, anything new to my website. You go to my website, put your email address in. You can sign up on there as well. Um, so thanks so much, everyone. Uh, I hope to see you again soon. And thanks for your messages, your emails and everything. Do keep those coming. And uh, yeah, I'll see you again soon. In the meantime, God bless.